Hello everyone, I'm Angeline Terry. Welcome to In Depth with Tommy Media. Closing arguments are scheduled for Monday in the murder trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin, who chose not to testify on his own behalf. His defense lasted two days, but the prosecution spent two weeks building a case that, with testimony that was emotional and condemned the cops' actions. Prosecution witnesses testified that Chauvin violated his training and used excessive force, and that George Floyd died from a lack of oxygen because of how his breathing was constricted. The defense tried to make a case that Chauvin acted reasonably against a struggling suspect and that Floyd died because of underlying heart conditions and illegal drug use. Today, I'm joined by St. Thomas Law professor and former federal prosecutor, Mark Osler, to talk about the ongoing trial. Mr. Osler, thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure. So several experienced officers, including Minneapolis Police Chief Miderna Ariadondo, testified that Chauvin should not have pinned Floyd to the pavement for close to nine and a half minutes. How common is it for police to testify in cases against other members of the police force? This is really groundbreaking. Um, you know, it wasn't just Chief Ariadondo. There were other officers, training officers, um, who testified against Derek Chauvin as well. Sometimes we hear reference to the blue wall of silence, which refers to the reluctance that police officers have to testify against other police officers. And this is really significant that we saw things play out differently in this case, that there was a clear condemnation of what Derek Chauvin did by other police officers from the same force. So it's rare to see law enforcement officials testify against one of their own. Is it also rare to see four minors called as witnesses in a case like this? And if so, why was that done? Well, I, for a few of them, it was important to call them because they took key video that we had a, a young woman who was 17 at the time who um, took the primary video that most of us saw when this story broke. And, you know, I, I've often thought that the most significant filmmaker of 2020 was, was her. And so with, with those witnesses who were key eyewitnesses who had to testify to actually making those videos, it probably was necessary to call them. However, the prosecution also called a nine-year-old girl um, who didn't take a video. And that probably was unnecessary. And that bothers me because of the tra traumatic effects, not only of witnessing someone being killed, uh, at age nine, but then having to relive that as a high pressure witness at a trial. Yeah, and speaking of re-traumatization, the prosecution also called George Floyd's brother for a so-called spark of life testimony, which is a rare legal maneuver used to humanize Floyd. Uh, what does that say about the prosecution strategy? Well, the thing about spark of life, it's, it's not rare in Minnesota, but Minnesota is the only state that I know of that allows that kind of testimony. Because usually what the person was like while they were alive isn't relevant to anything the government has to prove at trial. It can be relevant at sentencing, and we often hear victims' family members speak at sentencing. Um, but Minnesota does allow this, and prosecutors take advantage of it, to try to get the sympathy of the jury, to get them to engage more clearly. Um, I have a problem with the practice because I do think that it's not relevant to the to the. Um, the elements of the case that really they need to be focusing on. And George Floyd's death launched a worldwide protest that sparked a dialogue about race that continued amid this week's protest of Dante Wright, his death at the hands of the police. What part has race played in the courtroom discussion so far? Well, in terms of explicit discussions of race, there's been almost nothing. There have been a few eyewitnesses who talked about, um, you know, racialized policing. But other than that, we really heard no discussion of race. And, and there was something that happened that does tie this to really the worldwide um, arc of oppression regarding race. And that is that uh, the defense chose as their primary medical witness, someone who is from Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, uh, who was trained in South Africa and spent part of his career in South Africa. So there's somebody who spent a substantial part of his life in countries 
where white supremacy was a form of government. Um, and to have that come up right in the middle of the trial, and I'm not saying that that, that background makes anyone racist, but it's hard not to see the overtones of having someone with that background in the middle of a racially charged trial. Yeah, definitely. And in 2019, former Minneapolis police officer Mohamed Noor was convicted of third degree mur murder for an on-duty incident. That's one of the charges that Chauvin faces. So what do you think that the Noor case has done to change legal precedent of police related legal matters in Minnesota? And what role does that precedent play in Chauvin's trial? Yeah, this is fascinating that, that the Noor case and the Chauvin case are probably the two highest profile cases we've had in, in Minnesota in a while. And now they're intertwined because what happened is that there was a challenge made by the defense to the Noor conviction for third degree murder. And what they were arguing was that, that there have been some rulings in Minnesota that seem to say that third degree murder isn't appropriate if there's only a single target of the act. In other words, because the word others is used in the statute, that it only can be used if you're shooting at a crowd of people or you drive a, a car up on the sidewalk where there's a bunch of people, rather than shooting where there's only one potential target or in the Chauvin case, um, you know, the knee on the neck only threatened one person directly. Now the Supreme, or I'm sorry, not the Supreme Court, but the Court of Appeals ruled that third degree murder did apply in the Newark case. And that meant that uh, Judge Cahill really had to reinstate it, which he did. And that's one of the things that the jury will, will rule on in this case. However, the Supreme Court is going to review the Noor case in third degree murder there this summer. And that could have an impact on this case. For example, if they rule that, if they reverse the Court of Appeals and say it's not appropriate where there's only a single target, that could um, void the conviction of Derek Chauvin for that third degree. Chauvin faces charges of second degree unintentional murder, third degree murder, and second degree manslaughter. So based on how the trial has gone so far, which of these charges do you think is most likely to yield a conviction? I think, I think the most likely outcome is that he'll be convicted of all. Um, you know, if he's convicted of all, it's the highest uh, conviction that'll control. He's not, they don't stack the sentencing or anything. If, so if he's convicted of second degree murder, the third degree murder and the second degree manslaughter basically go away. Um, but I think that's the most likely outcome. The government put on a very strong and compelling case and the defense didn't have much to answer it. Um, now, the second most likely outcome, I, I think would be that they have a conviction just on third degree murder and second degree manslaughter, that could happen. Um, the third most likely outcome is that we'll have a hung jury. If there's a holdout juror who is against conviction and stands his or her ground, then we could have a hung jury. But I think that's pretty unlikely. Our most likely outcome definitely is a conviction on the highest charge. Wow. Well, uh, Mr. Osser, thank you so much for joining us. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. If you have a comment or an idea for a future in-depth segment, tweet it to at Tommy Media. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for all the latest Tommy Media videos. Thanks for joining us. With Mark Osler, I'm Angeline Terry. We'll see you next time we go in depth with Tommy Media.